Okay. All right, so we are going to leave the microphones on, on so you can actually just ask a question so at any time. All right, so let's start doing our lecture number five uh, in Advanced Anatomy Physiology. I'm Dr. G, and today the topic is uh, respiratory system. Talking about the respiratory system, let me see, okay. So first of all, uh, I would like just to show you here a tennis court. And the tennis court has something in, in common with the lungs. Why? Because we have the, the area of the, of the tennis court is the same area of what we have in, if we put all the alveoli uh, together in a plane. So all this area will be covering about the size of the tennis court. So uh, you can tell how much how how much area we have for gas exchange in, one, in only one person so this is amazing so that's what i like to share with you that then we have as you you can tell the lungs and the lungs one of the questions i always trying to find out how many alveoli we have in the lungs and the answer was about 350 million alveoli in every single lung. So total we have 700 million alveoli. So 350 is like the population of United States, including one lung, and 700 million is about alveoli. And you will see that with the time, these alveoli are going to start, uh, the lungs are having some changes, especially with age. Uh, we are going to go over or we, uh, in, in, on that in this, in this hour. Okay, so uh, one thing, what means alveoli? Alveoli is, means in Latin, a little cavity, little cavity. And what is the functional unit of the, of the, of the lung? Uh, some textbooks are talking about the alveoli, and other textbooks are talking about the assigning. Or as, assign is the plural, assignus is the singular. So uh, most of the books talking about, and this book too, is about the assignus. The sinus is going to be composed by the alveoli. This is the alveoli, the structure, the solid structure of the alveoli. The alveolar sac, that is the cavity in the alveoli. We have the alveolar, alveolar duct and the respiratory uh, bronchiole. So here we have the uh, terminal bronchioles. So after that, distally to the uh, terminal bronchio bronchioles, we have the respiratory bronchiole. And from here, to the alveoli is where it's going to be composed the sinus. So that is the uh, functional unit. And functional unit, as you can tell, is the unit that they can have all the functions of the whole organ. Now, uh, what is the primary function of the lung? If we think a little bit about what is really the main, the most important function of the lung, uh, that is to maintain the optimal levels of blood to uh, uh, satisfy the needs of the metabolic demands. So we, they are going to have optimal blood gases like carbon dioxide. You know, carbon dioxide is not only uh, a gas that we just eliminate, but it's going to have some uses, like, for example, the formation of uh, bicarbonate and uh, uh, hydrogens, or, for example, the carbon dioxide in order to stimulate the, the brain stem, the respiratory center, right? The medulla, sorry, in the, the respiratory center. All right, so now we, uh, in this class, we are going to talk, uh, uh, this is a kind of a summary of all what we are going to talk today. And uh, um, respiratory physiology uh, at this level, we actually, we need to understand what is the respiratory uh, physiology. Uh, uh, of the of the lung in order to understand what are the main respiratory problems or the main uh, diseases on the on the respiratory system so for this we need to really remember what are the lung volumes what are the lung capacities uh, and that is what we are going to review today so we have two main problems that uh, this Physiology will make us understand how is the pathology of these two main problems. The obstructive lung disease, 
obstructive gland disease, I tell you ahead of time, is asthma, for example, chronic bronchitis, emphysema. Very common, right? Restrictive lung, restrictive lung disease, and that is sarcoidosis. So talking uh, about the obstructive lung disease, we have asthma. Uh, for example, asthma, we have it's a very important uh, number. We have 23 million people in the United States who suffer asthma. And chronic, we have about 11 million. And emphysema, that is mostly happening in elderly people, about 6 million people who has. So we are talking about in the level of millions. Meantime, sarcoidosis, that is a restrictive, uh, restrictive lung, uh, lung disease, uh, we will have uh, about a 30, 32,000 cases. That is the minority, but actually never the, uh, the less uh, important. All right, so here we have obstructive lung disease. So asthma is our, uh, let's make it like an example. What happened here? The airflow is obstructed. Just to make it simple is that, uh, what is the problem with asthma? The problem with asthma is to inhale or to exhale. The problem is that uh, to exhale. So you exhale, you cannot get rid of all the air in the lungs. So what is doing that is that there is a trapping air, trapping air. When you have trapped air, uh, there is no space for new air. And that is actually characteristic of asthma. So what happened here? The airflow is obstructed. So we have different uh, situations that can, uh, can, can be with asthma, for example, uh, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, or any combination. And that can lead into, into, um, into COPD, the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So this is very common, obstructive lung diseases in the levels of millions. All right, so what we have is the flow rates are going down. So a spirometer we are going to use, we are going to know the values today. And mostly we have a prolonged expiratory volume. So that is part of the curves of the lung volumes the expiratory volume, expiratory volume. So it's going to be prolongated, it's going to be longer. Meantime, in the uh, um, restrictive lung disease, we have a diminish of compliance. What is compliance? Compliance is the inability to expand lung completely. So compliance means expans expansion of the, the lung. If you cannot expand the lung because you have some level of fibrosis, so, for example, sarcoidosis is uh, actually multisystemic inflammatory disease. Uh, the, the, the cause of that is unknown, and uh, they're mostly characterized by presence of granulomas, so presence of nodules that are going to produce fibrosis of the lung. So the compliance, so that means the ability to distend the lung is going to decrease, and that is what we call the restrictive lung disease. Um, we are going to uh, see some, some um, functional tests of, uh, of, of volumes in order to recognize and differentiate between obstructive lung disease and restrictive lung disease. So at this moment, just yes, uh, uh, let's uh, keep in mind obstructive asthma, restrictive sarcoidosis, fibrosis. All right, so let's continue. So let's talk about the volumes and capacities. So volumes are containing uh, compartments, uh, are the air, com uh, the air containing in the compartments of the lungs. So we, and then capacities, we have two, two terms, volumes and capacities. And uh, for example, the inspiratory uh, reserve volume, the expiratory reserve volumes, those are volumes, are, are how much volume you can inhale, how much volume you can exhale. So we are talking about one volume only at a time. And uh, capacities is going to be related to the sum or uh, the uh, summation of two or more of these volumes. So that is the first differentiation we are going to see in this, in this chart. So here we have, for example, uh, we have the inspiratory reserve volume. So it's after the tidal volume. Tidal volume is about uh, 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 500 cc. And after you have the normal exhale and inhale in, let's put it in the rest of the stage, the deep inspiration, forcefully inspiration to the maximum, that is going to lead into the inspiratory reserve volume. 
a tidal volume is what we are doing now, uh, normal breathing, uh, no uh, uh, any effort to, to breathe. The expiratory reserve volume is the, uh, the forcible expiration of the air from the lungs after the tidal. So can you see the tidal? Tidal end here, and then you, after that, exhale all the air you can. And that is going to uh, uh, actually uh, be, if you can see, this is a little bit lower or less volume than the inspiratory reserve volume. And we have the residual volume. The residual volume uh, we will see in the, in, the, in the next slides what is the function of the residual volume. Uh, residual volume are going to work together with the expiratory reserve volume called the functional residual capacity. So, as I will say, volume, volume, volume refer to one space, but next we are going to talk about capacity, capacities, capacities. So, that is, a, we say that these two or three volumes together. So, by the capacity, one capacity. See, all, everything on the right are capacity, everything in the left are volumes. Okay, so let's keep going, and I uh, actually... Uh, First of all, just remember, volumes is one space. Capacities are going to be two spaces. And this is uh, something that I just made, made it up uh, about how to remember the volumes on the, on, the, on the lung. So here we have, for example, L means the lung volumes. I means the insp inspiratory reserve volume, the inspiratory reserve, reserve volume. B is the tidal volume, tidal volume. E is the expiratory reserve volume, and R is the reserve volume. So if we go back to the slide here, we have L, lung volumes, I, inspiratory reserve volume, T, the tidal volume, the B of the, of the liver, expiratory reserve volume, and the residual volume. So we have how many of volumes? We have one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. So then we go to the capacities. And we already know that capacities is going to include two or more volumes. So the first two volumes are going to be the inspiratory and the tidal volume. That is the inspiratory capacity. And the, the second two volumes are going to form the functional residual capacity. Residual capacity. So the sum, the summation of all these, uh, all the volumes is what we call the total lung capacity. So it's going from here, sorry, from here, all the way down here. So this is the, the key that mentioned the total lung capacity. Meantime, the vital capacity is going to be everything as a total lung capacity minus the residual volume. So if we go here, we have here, the inspiratory reserve volume, uh, we have the functional reserve capacity. So, uh, the, sorry, that is the inspiratory capacity. Inspiratory capacity. This is the functional reserve capa uh, capacity. Then we have the uh, boolean, uh, volume capacity. Volume capacity is everything but no the R. And then we have the total lung capacity that are the four volumes. So that is probably uh, uh, some vi uh, visual in order to help, in order to remember this. So we will see that there are some changes with the time. When we uh, get older, there is some uh, volume or some uh, spaces are going to change. In elderly people, the total lung capacity is going to diminish about 0.2% a year. So the volumes are going to be lower in, in that case. In early, again, the volume capacity. The volume capacity is going to decrease in 0.5% uh, per year. So mostly the capacities are going to be affected in the, when we are getting older. In early, in addition, we have the reserve volume. Reserve volume is a volume that mostly we don't use and we will we will know how is useful why do we have this reserve volume this reserve volume is going to increase in the um, in the uh, elderly people in about one percent a year all right so here we have uh, some variations of the of the person according to the to the height to the weight 
to the gender. And we have the height, the long volumes, uh, you are taller, your volumes are going to increase in about 2% per centimeter. So as you get bigger or you get taller, your lung volumes are going to uh, increase. About gender, gender if male and female have the same age and the same height. So the lung uh, volumes in female are going to be about 10 to 50 percent less. So they have less lung uh, volume in, in, in female. All right, so what is the function of the functional, functional reserve reserve capacity, functional reserve capacity. And the, uh, and the functional reserve capacity is going to be the expiratory, uh, expiratory uh, volume, and we have the residual volume. So if we have here, what happened is this space, I'm going to go back here, the functional residual capacity that is going to have the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume is going to be important in one thing. When you are breathing, when we are breathing, uh, you notice that there is a, 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 a little moment or a, lap, uh, uh, a little time where you don't, you don't uh, uh, ventilate. So you are not going to bring in or bring out. So it's just a very momentous moment and between inspiration and expiration. And at the same time, the capillaries uh, around the alveoli are going to uh, have a continuous blood flow. So they never stop. They will never going to uh, stop the oxygenation of the blood. Even though that you have a small periods of apnea between inspiration and exhalation, the blood is still oxygenating. And that is, that is how the residual volume is from the functional receiver capacity is going to uh, have that role. So in conclusion, they are going to be a continuous blood flow into uh, oxygenation or continuous oxygenation into the capillaries. So that is what is the importance of, of the functional reserve capacity. All right, so let's keep going. So we have the inspiratory reserve volume that is the we have lung L as a liver, I inspiratory reserve volume is uh, three liters and a half. Then we have the tidal volume, volume B is the liver, or the word liver, and then we have the expiratory reserve volume, and we have the residual volume. Residual volume is about 1,200. When somebody have, um, when have asthma, uh, asthmatics are uh, being taught to uh, use more space from the residual volume. So uh, what they're doing is to uh, 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 blow against uh, force in order to expand and use a little bit more of the residual volume. Okay, so that the first two are going to be the inspiratory capacity when this is the sum of two or more our capacity, expiratory reserve volume and residual volume are going to be called the functional residual capacity. We already uh, talked about the importance about the functional residual capacity. Then we have here is going to be the vital capacity. See, the vital capacity is going to have three of these uh, uh, volumes, but not the residual volume. And at the end, we have the total lung capacity that including the four volumes. So if we play with these four volumes, actually we can have a um, uh, uh, good idea of what is going to uh, happen later in the restrictive and the, and the, what, and the obstructive uh, pulmonary diseases. Okay, so there is uh, some, another space that uh, we are going to mention is that uh, this is the anatomic dead space. What is the anatomic dead space? So uh, there is two portions on the, on the, uh, on the uh, respiratory system. One is the ducts, so the canals or ducts that are going to uh, transport or uh, transport the air. And then we have the respiratory ducts that are the ones who 
start to uh, distribute the uh, the air into the alveoli to make the gas exchange happen. So we have two uh, two components: the conduction and the uh, respiratory portion of the of the of the lung. The respiratory portion mostly is related to the asin asinus or asini in plural. So what is an atomic death in few words? An atomic, an atomic death space is uh, when you take air, inhale air, some air, for example, you inhale air, some air is going to stay in the main bronchi. And they are not going to progress because you cannot inhale more deeper. So that air, at the time you exhale, that is going to come out. So that is air who has oxygen that we actually don't use. So that is the anatomic, uh, anatomic dead space. Uh, one more thing is about the, um, the, um, what uh, we um, breathe in, breathe out. We are going to inhale about six liters of, of air every, every minute. I was doing some numbers here, and that is, at the end of the day, is going to be about 2,280 gallons. It's like filling my... Uh, USB card 95 times with full tank and but actually this air is not complete is not pure oxygen so as you can tell and this number we must remember is the saturation of oxygen in the air is about 21 percent so from all these 8,000 plus uh, liters of air that we breathe in uh, we are going to excel and Actually, uh, when we inhale, we inhale 21% of saturation of oxygen. But when we exhale, we are going to eliminate oxygen too, but air in the uh, with oxygen at 15% saturation. So that difference between 20, 21 coming in and 15 coming out, that means that the difference about 5% of the oxygen that are in the air are being used uh, are going to be assimilated or transported into the into the bloodstream. So that means that pure oxygen uh, we have about 500 liters of of air every day. 500 liters of air of oxygen every every day. And uh, just to make it short about the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is, uh, is that we eliminate a day is about 450 liters a day. So 500 liters of oxygen is what we consume, and for 550 liters of carbon dioxide is that we uh, can eliminate. Okay, coming back to the uh, anatomic data space, we have that this, uh, this volume of air uh, that are going to uh, not be uh, really uh, uh, transporting oxygen into the capillary bed are going to be between about 150 mL, about 150 mL every, uh, every breath. Okay, so here we have uh, some graphic about how are the divisions of the, of the, of the, of the bronchial tree. And we are going to have, first of all, the functional unit of the, of the lung is going to be called the sinus. And this sinus is going to uh, correspond to the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar uh, ducts, uh, they, change, they, they just change name, and the alveolar sacs, alveolar sacs, and the alveolar. Alveolar sacs are the space of the alveoli. All right, so I have here some graphic uh, that uh, probably is going to help us. Here we have, for example, the, the right lung, and we have the left lung. The right lung, we have three lobes, the upper, middle, and lower. The lower, uh, the lower lung, the left lung, we have upper and lower. If you see here, we have the trachea, and the trachea is going to measure about uh, 12, 15, 12 to 13 centimeters long, and they are going to bifurcate. We have the carina here that we already know, the carina and divide it into the right and the left uh, uh, main bronchi. You can see that it's more vertical, so most pneumonias by aspiration are going to happen in the in the right lung. Why? Because of the anatomical distribution of the, it's more straight, so 
if the food is coming for aspiration, where is most likely coming? This way or this way? So obviously this way to the right. But doesn't mean that the left, left side will not have uh, be in risk. So anyhow, so we have here the uh, trachea. The trachea divide into the two main bronchi. Two main bronchi. Then we have, uh, if you see here, the main bronchi the, or primary bronchi are going to divide in secondary bronchi. Secondary. Secondary. So secondary is here. We have three on the right and two on the left. Why? Because we have three three lobes in the right side. So we have the upper, the middle, and the lower. Meantime, in the in the um, in the left lobe, we have actually two uh, secondary bronchi. Then there are going to be the tertiary bronchi, and then after that we have okay. So we have the primary bronchi is the main bronchus. This one, this, and this secondary bronchus is the low, low, lower bronchus because they go to the lobes. Okay, one, two, three, one, two, here. Then we have the tertiary bronchus, that is the segmental bronchus. So every lobe uh, is going to have uh, uh, some segmentation. So we are not going to mention uh, in this class. Then after this, what is coming? So after the tertiary bronchus, so all these have uh, still having cartilage. In the, if you have an histological card. So then you have here what we call the bronchioles. The bronchioles are the continuation of that after the tertiary bronchus are going to come the bronchioles. And the bronchioles, we have 23 generations, 23 bifurcations. They are going to divide 23 times. And you can see here, we have, this is the conducting bronchioles. So we have at the beginning, we were mentioned, that the bronchi, uh, there is part of the bronchial tree that is going to transport, and another is the one who start to make the gas exchange, respiratory bronchi, bronchi. So we are still in the conducting bronchioles. So they are going to conduct the uh, actually the uh, air through these 23 uh, generations. Then this generation at the end, the, uh, the about the 22nd, 23rd. They are going to change name, and it's going to call, it's the same, but it's going to change name. It's called the terminal bronchi, terminal bronchi. The terminal bronchi, sometimes uh, some consider a transitional zone, but in this case, we are going to just call directly the respiratory bronchi. Respiratory, respiratory bronchi is already uh, actually distributing the oxygen for the, um, for the uh, gas exchange. Then we have the alveolar ducts. This. So they just change names is because they are more distally. So, for example, if we ask you uh, uh, where are the respiratory bronchioles, you will answer are distal to the terminal bronchial. If, I, if we ask you what, where, where are the alveolar ducts, they are distal to the respiratory bronchioles. Same after this, we are going to have the uh, alveolar sac. Alveolar sac are actually all this group of cavities that are formed by many alveolus or many alveoli. So, and the alveoli is the saccular sac itself. All right, so we have the bronchi bronchioles. They are going to continue to the terminal bronchioles. Then we have the respiratory bronchioles. Then we have the alveolar ducts. And the they are going to end into the alveolus, into the alveolus. All right, so uh, remember the, um, the a sinus is the functional unit of the lung, and that is going to go from the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, alveolar sacs, and the alveolus. Okay, so... Uh, all right, so we have all the terminology that I just going to mention is the secondary lobule. Sometimes you were going to find in your, uh, in your some textbooks, and that is referred to a group of these ducts: terminal bronchial, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolus. And uh, uh, actually, the uh, primary lobule that are the two distal more portions of the of the, alveol of the sinus that is alveolar ducts and alveolus. So, but remember, a sinus is the functional unit of the, of the 
All right, so here we have uh, some graphic here. So here you can tell that the, um, uh, in the conductive in the conductive area, mostly the the ducts are going to be formed by uh, cartilage. Cartilage is gone. That is going to be the difference from the respiratory area of the of the of the lung. So here we have the sinus, the respiratory bronchial. This this portion, al alveolar duct. We have the alveolar sac that are actually this, 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 this. Then we have the alveoli itself. And that is the functional unit of the of the lung. All right, so uh, here we are going to talk about the relationship between the force expiratory volume, B1. So if you see uh, this wording is uh, force expiratory volume 1, and 1 means in one second. Okay, so what they are going to do is to make you uh, use this spirometer here, and you, uh, uh, this spirometer, and that is going to be about four uh, liters of total. Uh, is going to be about four thousand or four liters of, of air. So what they are going to do is, first of all, uh, they are going to ask you to inhale deeply without the machine yet in this piece in your mouth, deeply and exhale all you can. Then you repeat the same thing the second time. Then in the third time, when you exhale everything, they want to be sure that you uh, exhale all the air. They put this in your mouth, the spirometer, and they are going to ask you to blow as, as, as strong as you can. That machine is going to measure in the first second how much volume is going to be excelled. So actually, we then uh, they are going to be calculated with a force by the capacity. Is a, actually is the maximum amount uh, of an individual can, uh, can breathe a single time. And that is according to the age, to the gender, and uh, to the height of the patient. So they are going to make the division between this and this. And they are going to uh, 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 divide it. And you have a range that is a normal value of more than 70. Uh, more than, because it's a ratio. It doesn't have units. They are going to be more than 70. It's, it's actually 70%. Uh, it's about 70 to 80% normal. And, uh, here we have in the obstructive lung disease, in obstructive lung disease like asthma, this uh, 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 FAB1 or FAB1 are going to be less than 0 0.8. So that means less than 80. And restrictive lung disease is going to be more than 8, 0 0.8 or, 8, or 80. So that is a ratio. So that's why you can make 0 0.8 or 80%. Uh, 80% or 0 0.8. All right, so uh, here the restrictive lung disease uh, looks like this is normal, right? But uh, actually it's not because they have some problems of oxygenation. So there should be some additional signs and symptoms that actually de uh, decrease the oxygenation of blood. So that is is not alone. The exam is going to be companion to another lab test. But the normal value is 70 to 80. Uh, obstructive is less or equal to 80, and restrictive lung disease is more than 80, with signs and symptoms of uh, the disease, Ex uh, for example, sarcoidosis. Okay, so the mechanism of breathing, uh, we have here uh, the diaphragm, rectus abdominus, internal, external, intercostal, external, cladomastoid, serratus muscles and the uh, escalenous muscles, the anterior, the medial, and the posterior. So here, actually, what we need to just remember that during inspiration, the, the most important muscle is going to be the diaphragm. During expiration, the most important muscles are going to be the internal and external intercostal muscles. Uh, so, during resting, you know that is automatic. Uh, automatic uh, 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 respond is an, uh, like a, a reflex. What we have is the muscle, the diaphragm muscle is automatically relax or uh, contract. All right. So during expiration, we have the the lungs are going to contract uh, ele by elevating the uh, and depressing the ribs. So you depress the ribs; they are going down. 
you're actually squeezing your, your thorax, making, making the pressure of the air inside the lungs higher than the pressure of the atmospheric pressure. The atmospheric pressure uh, is going to be lower than the pressure that you have in the lungs. So that's why you can exhale. In the inspiration, the, because the lungs or the thorax have a negative pressure, it's going to work like a kind of a vacuum, and they are going to have the atmospheric pressure is higher, the opposite, is higher than the, uh, the pressure inside the lungs. So we are going to explain a little bit more about that. But here we have, for example, the inspiration, what it's doing. If you uh, breathe in, you will see the thorax is going to uh, increase in size. So the ribs are elevated and increase the anterior-posterior diameter. And in expiration, the anterior-posterior anterior -posterior diameter are going to be depressed, are going to decrease. OK? All right, so let's talk about compliance. Compliance, compliance, we was talking about compliance in the heart. We was talking about elasticity in the heart. And that's actually similar concepts. Just to make it simple about compliance, compliance is the ability of to distend, uh, uh, distend the lung in this case. So how easy, or how difficult is that to the distension of the lung? High, uh, uh, good co uh, compliance, high compliance, is going to make easier the lung to distend. Low compliance are going to make it harder to distend the lung. And in this, in this case, uh, we have some pressures here, and that is the representation of the alveoli in general. And what we can tell is that compliance is going to follow a, a, a formula that is the Laplace or Laplace formula. We are going to see that in a few moments. So, but what is going to be interesting to talk about compliance is that if you, for example, blow uh, a balloon, a balloon, you want uh, you you want a balloon, you want to blow and put uh, air inside. It, it's not difficult to blow uh, air at the very beginning. Yes, it's much much harder. When once you already uh, put some air inside the balloon. The balloon is going to be, after that, easier to start filling up with, uh, with uh, air. Uh, we have all, the, all, all of us, we have that experience. So what is making the uh, Laplace formula uh, telling? What is telling us is, first of all, you have a ratio, the diameter of the balloon, right? It's very tiny at the beginning. So as they get bigger, the ratio, the ratio, the ratio the, uh, the, the pressure that are going to make, try to come back, are going to change with the, the sensibility. So mostly what you see is the compliance is going to be increasing as more air you're going to get in. Okay, so we have here, for example, obstructive emphysema, emphysema, asthma, uh, chronic bronchitis, COPD, all are in that, in that range of obstructive emphysema. So you can, uh, you can see here that uh, uh, the pressures, for example, for uh, compliance are going to be higher in the, in the fibrosis. Fibrosis is the um, uh, sarcoidosis that we was talking, is the restrictive. And uh, if you can tell what is fibrosis, sarcoidosis, it, that means that the uh, elasticity, the compliance of the lung is going to be lost. Why? Because the fibrous tissue would not have the elasticity of the normal lung tissue. All right, so let's talk about the surfactant substance. All right, so one thing that is going to be part of the how these alveoli are going to distend or are going to uh, fill it with, with air, is the surfactant substance. Surfactant substance is, a, is a, a substance that is composed by proteins and some lipids. These surfactant substances are going to reduce the tension of surface. So what I want to tell you, and just to understand this, this is very easy, if you put a drop of water in the table, and you put another drop of water on the table close to that first drop, what happened? They attract to each other, correct? 
So they are going to just create one big drop. It's the same thing with the uh, with the uh, surface tension. The water, the water, we don't have one or two drops, but we have multiple drops, multiple drops of water coming together, and they are going to try to hold each other, hold each other. So this this tension are going to be called the surface tension. So this surface tension is going to uh, uh, imagine this fluid inside the alveoli here. This is the alveolus. In the alveolus we have a, 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 like a cover, a lining of water. This uh, fluid, this fluid, when you exhale, when you take out all the air, the water is trying, the, the walls are going to come together and coming together, so that means that the fluid is coming together. So at the time that they want to reopen the alveoli, so there is going to be a resistance because there is a surface, surface tension. And what is happening here is that we have different uh, cells. We have the alveolar type 1 cell that is composed, is going to be part of the wall of the alveolus. And we have another cell that is the alveolar type 2 cell. This alveolar type 2 cell is the one who produces the surfactant substance. This surfactant substance is going to, actually what it's going to do, is I show, if I show you this picture, uh, here we have the fluid. This is a surfactant substance. What it's doing? It's trying, it's going to separate the, uh, the fluid in particles, in portions. So that is not going to be difficult to be away from the wall each other. So that's how the surfactant substance is going to work. Another, for example, you have soap in fat. The soap in fat, what happens when the soap follows in the sink with, in the fat, is going to make it apart. So that is because the surface tension is being diminished. Uh, the, uh, another thing that we need to remember is about the, um, when we produce this surfactant substance. Uh, uh, there is a term we call premature baby and a mature baby, right? A premature baby is called premature baby because if they born at that time, the baby is not going to be able to survive by itself without assistance. So that is because there is a, the lungs at that time cannot work yet. Why? Because the surfactant substance that are uh, in the in the lungs are not going to be a, a pro, uh, almost completely produced up to 37 weeks of gestation. The surfactant substance produced by the alveolar type 2 cell is going to start producing between 24 to 28 weeks of gestation. At they are start increasing the volume of this surfactant substance and they are going to reach maximum production in about 37 weeks. So after that, the, uh, the lungs are going to have enough su surfactant substance, especially about 39 weeks. Uh, and that is where the baby, after they born, we cut the umbilical cord, uh, cord cutting the umbilical cord, the carbon dioxide, uh, cutting the umbilical cord, the baby do not receive any more carbon di uh, oxygen, sorry. And what happened? The baby start to accumulate carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide accumulating in the in the blood of the baby are going to go to the medulla oblongata. Uh, they are going to activate the respiratory center, and that is uh, because of the amount of carbon dioxide stimulating this area is going to produce the reflex of the first breathing of the of the baby. All right, so that is what we just mentioned. So uh, if you make an experiment uh, with your clip, I, I don't, if you have the time to do it. And so yes, and, uh, and the clip is going to be an example of how the clip cannot sink in the in the water because of this a, a attraction of the molecules of water a, that is going to diminish with the surfactant substance. Okay, uh, surfactant has both hydrophobic and hydrophilic ends, and that is what lowers the surface tension inside the uh, uh, alveoli. So there is some portions of the surfactant. So you have proteins. So you we remember that the surfactant substance is made up by uh, lipids and proteins. So one is uh, hydrophilic and 
and the, uh, the other one is going to be hydro, hydrophobic. Hydrophobic, the fat portion, and uh, protein uh, is the portion of hydrophilic. So that's why I can divide the tensions of the attraction between the uh, between this uh, um, uh, um, between these uh, molecules of water. So without surfactant substance, our lungs uh, would collapse, resulting in medical condition known as a telectasis. A telectasis. So a telectasis. So that means that when you exhale. The, uh, the walls of the, of the alveolus are going to touch to each other, but there is no surfactant substance that decreases the tension between them, and the alveoli cannot, is not able to insufflate again or fill it up with, uh, with what? With air. So that means the atelectasis, so that means that the lung is going to just, uh, the, the alveoli is totally collapsed. It's totally collapsed. All right, so here's the Laplace law. I'm talking about Laplace law is a, is the example I was telling you about the balloon. So we have here the pressure, and we have we have the surface tension, and here we have the ratio, the uh, the ratio ratio. So if you can tell, this is these two are dividing. So the pressure, the pressures that tend to collapse the alveolus. That is the Laplace. Uh, the place. So when the tension is high, higher, when the ratio is lower, remember the balloon. When we we are blowing the balloon, the balloon at the beginning, the ratio, the, the duct is going to be very, very tiny, very thin. So if there is thin, this operation is going to be higher. Remember, so the pressure is going to be more difficult. The pressure that try to keep close the balloon is going to be higher. But as more you insufflate air into the lungs, into the balloon. This ratio is going to increase, so diminishing the operation here, the, I mean the division, and the coefficient, co co coefficient is going to be less, so the pressure is going to be less. So that's why is that Laplace law is going to explain how a, the, um, a balloon at the beginning is hard to insufflate, but later on it's going to be easier. Same with the lungs. At the beginning, the pressure is going to be harder, but as more they insufflate the Compliance is going to be part of that. It's going to increase, and the um, and the uh, pressure is going to uh, is going to be lower uh, to distend in order that is going to be able to distend the um, the lung. All right. So we have another formulas here that are we saw in the in the in Bernoulli uh, uh, formula in cardiac. Uh, we have factors that contribute the airway resistance is the compliance. We already know that the compliance is how easy it is to distend the, the, the lung. And the airway resistance, we have the viscosity. So you can tell is the, the, uh, the, more, uh, the more viscosity, uh, the more viscosity is going to be the, um, the more resistance. So if this formula is about the uh, resistance, we have this R replaced by this formula. So everything that is in this denominator are that are going to increase are going to make the pressure higher. The resistance are going to be higher. So for example, if you increase the viscosity, it's going, going to be. If you uh, uh, for example, if you uh, increase the uh, increase the length of the tube, and if you actually decrease if you decrease, if you decrease the ratio, the ratio is, if you decrease the ratio, the ratio is going to change the pressure in about the power of four. If the ratio of the airway diminish, the airway resistance, so if this is lower, it's going to be lower, this is going, this coefficient is going to be higher by uh, mathematical uh, elaboration. And that is going to be for factor four. So, in conclusion, you will see that the ratio is the one who uh, play a, a most crucial role in order to have the distension and filling up the lungs with uh, with air. All right. So, gas exchange. Uh, we we will talk about the um, composition of the air, and the composition of the air 
is going to be about we don't have we not we don't only inhale air oxygen but nitrogen but uh, oxygen too and other gases like carbon dioxide argon and uh, um, for example helium etc okay so uh, just to uh, know here is that the um, proportions of oxygen in the air are going to be changing according to the altitude the more concentration of air, of oxygen in the air, is going to be at the level of the ocean. Meantime, at the level of high altitude, the, uh, the levels of oxygen are going to actually uh, decay. So, for example, Everest, so this is an example that is given uh, in this, uh, in this uh, part, is that the, so the concentration of oxygen in air is about 12%. Is almost 50% of what we have at the level of the ocean. So here we have, as you can tell, this is the alveolus. This is the, uh, um, this is the alveolar capillary, the wall of the alveolus, the alveolar wall. And this is the capillary. We have 700 million of these alveolus. Uh, mostly of them are going to be surrounded by a capillary. So the gas exchange, as we remember, is going to happen by simple diffusion. No consume of uh, energy. And why is that happen? Is because when the blood is coming back, uh, collecting all the carbon dioxide from all the cells, uh, product of the metabolism, is going to be just a number, 45 here, just to give a number, 45. Meantime, the uh, the air in the alveoli is 40 millimeters of mercury. So here we have less concentration of CO2 and high concentration of CO2 in the, in the uh, venule and capillary. So what happened? The CO2 is going to go from higher concentration, 45, to lower concentration, 40. And that is for, by simple diffusion. Uh, in the opposite, we have when you inhale air, you are uh, having uh, oxygen, and this oxygen, the uh, uh, pressure is going to be uh, about 104 millimeters of mercury. Meantime, the pressure here on the oxygen that is coming back is they're going to find about 40 millimeters of mercury. So actually, the oxygen is going to pass from higher concentration to lower concentration in the capillary. And that's how the gas exchange is going to happen. Then we have, uh, we have a, a, some concept that we need to learn. First of all, air is composed by many gases, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, etc. And each, each, uh, each gas is going to be able to contribute with a portion of the uh, total pressure inside the lung. And for that, we are going to use the Dalton's law of partial pressures. It's very simple. Uh, formula because we are going to see that total pressure is the sum or the summation of the partial partial gases in the in the air. So that is going to if you sum the pl uh, uh, partial pressure of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and others are going to give you the total pressure that we have in the in the lungs. All right. So here we have some concentration of. Uh, so can you can you see here the highest concentration in air is going to be in nitrogen. Then we have oxygen, 20, 21 percent. So there is some formulas here. So for example, we have uh, the uh, the partial pressure is equal the total pressure multiplied by the concentration of oxygen percentage concentration of oxygen. In, in air so this is the formula so what is the uh, total uh, so the total uh, concentration will be about 160 millimeters of mercury however in the air the trachea it becomes hum hum humidified by all, by water and uh, this partial pressure is 47 so we need to diminish from the uh, 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 total pressure 760, oh, sorry, atmospheric pressure 760 minus 47, and that then multiplied by 
and actually the partial pressure of oxygen in the in the alveoli is going to be about 150 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so let's talk about the transportation and dissociation of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And here uh, we are going to see uh, very simple the um, the uh, molecules of, of of hemoglobin here. So uh, this is a red blood cell, and we know the red blood cells has uh, hemoglobin. How many? This is the whole molecule of hemoglobin. How many molecules of hemoglobin we have? So how many of these equal we have inside the cell? We have about 24,000 of these molecules of hemoglobin. So one hemoglobin, a red blood cell does not have one hemoglobin only. They have 24,000 of these molecules of hemoglobin, 24,000 of these structures. Now, every single structure of each of these, of of each 24,000 or one of these is going to have four subunits, subunits. Green, well, color you want, and four, four sub, subunits. Each subunit is going to have an iron. <clears throat> so each molecule of hemoglobin, obviously, is going to hold one molecule of oxygen in each of these iron. All right, so there is some differences between, uh, uh, we have the alpha and the beta uh, polypeptide chains, and that is uh, what we call in the hemoglobin alpha, uh, uh, two alphas and two betas. So in this, we have two alphas, one alpha, uh, one alpha, one beta, and another beta. So two betas and two alphas. So uh, these alphas are going to be different because the betas, we don't have the beta in fetal life. We have, instead of that, the two gamma, two gamma, two gamma uh, polypeptide chain that is the characteristic of these two gamma is to uh, have higher affinity, much higher affinity than the beta, the adults. Uh, that's why when the baby is born, uh, what they are going to have is some physiological or physiologic uh, 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 hemolysis, physiological hemolysis, and they are going to have what we call a physiological jaundice. Uh, why? Because at the time the baby is born, the two, uh, the chain, the polypeptide chain, two gammas are going to start to dissolve, are going to start to disappear, regenerate, uh, I mean degenerate, and they are going to be replaced with the beta-2 chains. So that's why the baby is going to be normally having some um, some uh, jaundice or some etheric state, state after three days after they born, and they last up to seven days. These three to seven days is the time that the, the body is going to need in order to completely replace the uh, gamma chains with the um, beta chains. Okay, so we have uh, here, uh, we have some, um, a, the dissociation of uh, hemoglobin, and just to finish this, because I think we are a little bit behind. Okay, so we have the dissociation of the, of the, uh, um, of the hemoglobin and oxygen. So first of all, lungs, blood, lung blood pick up oxygen with uh, hemoglobin saturation at 100%. You know that our saturation is going to be normal between 98%, uh, 100%. They can be from 90 to 100, actually, the normal range. 89 is already some hypoxia. Then as the blood travels, it will collect in carbon dioxide released by the tissue. So what happened here? What happened is, uh, you know, the carbon dioxide is coming from the Krebs cycle. And we have 100 trillion cells in the body, and every cell is going to release carbon dioxide after they use the nutrients. So this carbon dioxide, they go to the blood. And in blood, what happened, uh, we find water. So carbon dioxide, they are going to combine with water. So what they are going to produce is carbonic acid. That is uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not uh, very, it's a very, it's not a strong acid, and this, uh, by uh, carbonic acid is going to dissociate 
almost immediately into bicarbonate and uh, hydrogen. <laughs> bicarbonate and hydrogen. So the more carbon dioxide we accumulate, for example, let's put it this way, some, somebody doesn't have, uh, they're getting uh, drowning in the, in, the, in the beach or on the, on the, on the on the water or something, they're going to start to accumulate carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide is going to lead into mo more production of a, uh, 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 protons of hydrogen. So that means that the pH of the blood starts to decrease. When this uh, pH decrease means become more acid, uh, become more become more hydrogens. So the bike, the hemoglobin oxygen affinity are going to decrease. So what does it mean that the hemoglobin is starting to release all the oxygens that are going to be uh, in the ions of the molecule of the hemoglobin? And the carbon dioxide is picked up by the blood in, ex uh, in exchange. So when carbon dioxide enters to the red blood cells, so we, say, we see here that they are going to actually, uh, when, uh, when it's happening the opposite, they are going to reverse the, uh, the reaction. As this happens, carbon dioxide is expelled because the pH is in blood is going to go up. So and the affinity of oxygen are going to increase. Okay, so uh, I really like, please, I was trying to make a, 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 this, uh, a, they have a video about the, um, uh, the, part, the rest of the, of the lecture. I really want just to thank you for your time. It's already 9.4. And uh, if you have some questions, please, I will really happy to, uh, to solve it. If not, no, it really I, I will try to, to communicate with, uh, with you with the forum. And if any questions, I will be more than happy to answer. Uh, any questions, Joe or, or Sarah, please. Um, no, I think I'm okay for now, Dr. G. Okay, yeah. sorry. Will this, will this be printed, uh, available to be printed? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. It's going to be okay. printed, and uh, I will I will uh, keep in touch with you guys tomorrow and see uh, how we, we we was doing in the, what, what we can have as a feedback uh, in, the, in, the, in the, I'm sure that both of you are doing great. And thank you. You are, we are the only, the survivors of this group. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. G. Okay, guys. So, have a nice weekend. Same to you. Thank you for coming. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Bye.